Hello, good evening, everyone. Very warm welcome. My name is Sarah Sands. Um, I was, until very recently, the editor of the London Evening Stand. I can't think who's editing it now. Um, and today is my very first day um, in a new job. So, um, first guest as, um, uh, on the Today programme, which I'm now editing, um, was, of course, Matthew Taylor. So, both of us just look utterly knackered now. <laughs> so, we're really, really interested in this, uh, in this subject of uh, quality of work. Um, conditions and this sort of sense uh, that you know that you can be happy at work um, so um, that's that's um, what we're going to be sort of learning about and then everything that goes with it about sort of productivity and and actually what's interesting to me was that immediately sort of flung into the election discussions um, that followed this morning you know the, the sense of what um, what Theresa May is going to stand for and um, that somehow she, she has really sort of cottoned on to this idea of um, what kind of workforce we are, how productive we're going to be, and um, what are the sort of expectations of, um, of, of this new kind of, of workforce. So, um, as you know, Matthew um, is going to be doing a, 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 a report that's out in June, um, which really will be key. Um, so I'm delighted um, that he is here this evening to... Um, give you um, his lecture. Um, and just a quick reminder that we're filming this evening, st uh, st streaming oh, uh, live over the web. Welcome to everyone joining us online. Hope you'll get involved in the discussion via Twitter using the hashtag goodworkis. Um, and the, um, as I said, the, the conversation prepares the ground for a publication of a government review of modern employment um, that Matthew's been leading. Um, and um, something that particularly comes out, of course, the, the whole sort of Brexit um, uh, debate um, and the political party fortunes. Um, so we're delighted that following Matthew's opening address, we're going to be joined by a distinguished panel um, of experts, and I'll be introducing them to you all in due course. So before then, we have a, a very short film to set the scene for this year's annual Chief Executive's Lecture, Good Work for All. My name is Bradley and my idea of good work is something that challenges you constantly and that gets you up in the morning. My name is Adana and I think good work is being useful to society, giving back to my community and it should be fun. My idea of good work is uh, getting up, working hard and making sure you love what you do. Good work means to be operating effectively with a purpose. My name's Luke, I'm a police officer. Uh, good work to me is making sure you still have that Friday feeling on Monday morning when you're going back to work. My name is Petan and I work for a charity. I think good work is feeling fulfilled. Good work for me is all about filming and enjoyment. My idea of good work is do some good and have some fun. I think good work is meaningful, purposeful and creative. I think good work is uh, being happy, passionate, putting heart and soul into it and uh, enjoying yourself. Um, thank you, Sarah. And, um, with such a great panel of respondents, it's incumbent on me to keep my remarks short so that we can hear um, from them and most of all to hear from you. So this is my tenth annual lecture as RSA Chief Executive and this year the choice of subject was easy. I have after all spent most of the last seven months thinking about work. When I was asked to chair the employment review, my Whitehall handlers told me that it would take about one day a week. It's often felt more like one day a day. Because of PERDA, I won't this evening be discussing the specific recommendations of the review, but I will talk about something that is shared by the RSA and by the review team that I've been working with, and that's a commitment to improving the quality of work in the UK economy. There are two reasons why I wanted to provoke a public debate about good work. First, although we've had uh, in the review positive engagement from across government, there's always a slight danger with things like this that they're set up to respond to an immediate political need and when that moment passes the review is left high and dry. The graveyard of government reviews is not meritocratic. Some very good work has been buried. 
So it's important to stay in the public eye. We've toured around the country, sharing our thoughts with audiences from Belfast to Maidstone. We've been helped by a string of high-profile court cases about the employment status of taxi drivers, couriers, plumbers. The Chancellor's announcement in the budget and the subsequent U-turn added another shot of publicity to our work. But despite all of that, it's always been my plan to try to push the issue of good work up the agenda in the weeks ahead of our report. And I'm very grateful to the many people who have in one way or another joined in the RSA's Good Work Is social media campaign over recent days. But as well as making sure that people are ready for the review, the second reason is that in my experience, and judging by the evidence from surveys of public policy success and failure, and sadly failure is the norm, uh, and based on the RSA's way of thinking, we've come to the conclusion that legitimacy is vitally important to social change. Indeed, that was the theme of my annual lecture last year. If the public don't understand what change is for, don't agree with its direction, or don't believe its goals are possible, then even well-crafted policy initiatives are likely to fail. Our review was given broad terms of reference. It's not just about gig working, as it's sometimes reported. It's about how we improve the quality of working lives across our economy. But the review only makes sense, and it's only likely to gain traction if not just the government, but the country as a whole, workers, employers, consumers, citizens, think that good work matters and the good work economy is one we should and that we can build. And that's why I was pleased yesterday to see the results of a survey by Populous commissioned by the RSA. That survey found that three out of four people think we should do more as a country to improve the quality of work. Perhaps more telling is the contrast between the over two-thirds who think that we can make all work fair and decent and the less than one in ten who think this is the case now. Now, I agree with the public. And I want to explain why this is the time to commit to good work. But before I do, is it even necessary? Surely no policymaker or business leader, however hard-nosed, would oppose the goal of good work. So it's important to recognise that a genuine commitment to that goal would be a substantive shift. For several decades, encapsulated in the phrase work first, government policy has prioritised creating more jobs over the content and nature of those jobs. And there's been an implicit assumption that there's a trade-off between quantity and quality. The major exception to that assumption was the creation of the minimum wage in 1999 and its upgrade to a living wage. But it isn't just policymakers who are ambivalent about good work. Despite the polling I've just cited, there's a widespread scepticism that all work can be good work. As I've toured the studios today, that's the question that's been asked more than anything else. Won't there always just be terrible jobs? And from some business interests, we still hear the implicit argument that to aim for better work would somehow undermine competitiveness. So in making the case for good work for all, we are pushing against assumptions in policy, against public scepticism, and against the perceived interests of some parts of business. So that means the argument has to be strong. My case this evening, and until and beyond the publication of the review, is that all work in the British economy should be fair, should be decent, and should provide scope for, film, for fulfilment and for progression. I've made this case in some detail in an article published today on the RSA website, so now I'm just going to stick to five broad <coughs> brush strokes. The first part of the argument is this. Having a job is sadly no guarantee of being free of poverty. In fact, of the 13.5 million people in the UK living in poverty, 55% are in working households. Now, the living wage will make an impact on this. And despite the cuts that have come and the cuts that are planned, our tax credit system is more comprehensive than most countries. But still, it's difficult to see a route through existing policy that can lead us away from high levels of working poverty. The scale of in-work poverty makes a case for better work on several levels. Clearly, our ultimate goal should be to create higher paid, more productive jobs. And one important implication of that is that industrial strategy needs to be about low-skilled, low-pay sectors like care, retail, hospitality, as well as top-end high-tech areas. For many people, the question is less about the job they have now and more about the job they hope to get next. Less than half the respondents to that survey that I cited felt that they had made progress in their careers over the last five years. So we need to develop better paths of progression. Every job needs to be one that offers workers the realistic prospect of getting better work in the future. 
And because in-work poverty is unlikely to be abolished for the foreseeable future, we have a moral responsibility to ensure that those who are poorly paid are at least able to exercise their rights at work and be treated with care and respect. Second, while most people say they enjoy their work, as Carol will no doubt confirm, some types of work can make you sick. Work that is stressful and over-intense, work that is controlling and inflexible. Stress at work is strongly linked to both physical and mental illness. Our most comprehensive survey of working life, the Workplace Employment Relations Survey, found in 2012 that 37% of workers report stress always or often, compared to 28% in 1989. Stress levels have traditionally been higher amongst more senior jobs, but that is now shifting, with levels rising fastest amongst low-skilled, lower-paid workers. It's often argued that the worst work status for health is unemployment, and that's true, but it's not an argument against better work. In fact, intensive work with low levels of flexibility and autonomy is a critical factor, leading to hundreds of thousands of workers dropping out of employment every year. Bad work impacts directly on workers, but also on the rest of us through greater pressure on our welfare and healthcare systems. Third, as we all know, the UK has a productivity problem. That problem is complex, multifaceted, but there's little doubt that one aspect is bad work. Bad work that is often the result of weak and unimaginative management. In a recent speech, the Bank of England's chief economist, Andy Haldane, pointed to research suggesting that a one standard deviation improvement in the quality of management raises productivity by an average around 10%. It's not surprising that the new productivity leadership group, group led by Sir Charlie Mayfield has made improving the quality of UK management a core priority. And there's a lot that needs to be done. Levels of investment in employee training and learning is less than half in this country of our European competitors and it's fallen even further in recent years. Despite the overwhelming evidence that employee engagement contributes to higher productivity, overall levels of reported employee engagement are low in the UK and the proportion of low-skilled workers in this country who report they have no freedom to shape the organisation of their work has, according to one authoritative survey, increased substantially over the last decade. Fourth, all these issues are made more urgent by the pace of technological change. We don't have to sign up to some of the wilder estimates of job losses or to the vision of a post-work utopia to recognise that forms of automation including particularly robotics and machine learning, are going to have a huge impact on jobs and on workers. PwC have, for example, estimated that up to a third of UK jobs are susceptible to automation by the early 2030s. These are issues the RSA has started to look at in depth and hopes to explore further through a new future of work centre. The way we innovate needs to be informed by our commitment to decent work. There's a danger that in our focus on technological possibility, we forget that innovation and productivity are secured by the way that human beings and machines interact. Organisational and service design, ergonomics, human factors are just as important to productivity as algorithms and robotics. We should avoid technological determinism. As the RSA has pointed out in a recent report, gig work facilitated by sophisticated online platforms, can be an opportunity to exploit and atomize workers, but it also provides scope for new forms of worker empowerment and control. A world in which workers are slaves to systems and machines would not only be chilling, it would also be a world of greater risks, more discontent, and ultimately lower economic utility. And as technological progress increases job churn, job churn, it makes it even more important that all work enhances people's future job prospects. As I said, I'm not going to talk tonight in detail about the recommendations of the Employment Review, but one theme is likely to be the importance of government taking the lead in agreeing and promoting a framework for employability skills. This is a framework that should sit across apprenticeships and university careers guidance and provide a basis to assess how jobs enhance, enhance not just skills specific to that job, but broader, more generic work capabilities. Finally, there is the deeper relationship between work and society. In my media interviews today, I've been asked whether work has got worse. As I've outlined in this speech, in certain respects, it has. But in a way, that's missing the point. The question is not just what's happening, but what do we want to happen? I'm not going to get into the murky waters of the debate about Brexit or the rise of political populism. But I think that most people would agree that in place of what sometimes appears to be a widespread feeling of passive resentment, we need to try to foster an attitude of citizen engagement. 
Taking back control may be about voting in a referendum, but it's also about people feeling they can make a difference, that it's worth contributing to civic life, trying to make our communities stronger, more vibrant. But if we want to encourage active and engaged citizenship in society, can we tolerate the denial of recognition, respect and engagement at work? As we encourage people to vote in the next election, to inform themselves of issues, to volunteer in their community, is it defensible to say that for eight or more hours a day they should accept being ignored, denied information, treated as mere cogs in a machine? Why is it that the commercial offer to consumers, the offer of personalisation and empowerment, seems so much more ambitious than our offer to many people at work? I've got nothing against shopping. But can a healthy society be one in which the status of consumer seems more developed and ambitious than that of producer? Work needs to live up to our changing aspirations. The World Values Survey finds that more people now put emphasis on greater self-expression as their key aim in life. If we continue to deny those hopes at work, we will frustrate people and contribute to social pessimism and disenchantment. So let me conclude. Work defines our identity. It's central to our day-to-day -day existence and to the long narratives of our lives. My first employment included being a checkout operator, a bakery assistant, and a street sweeper, a job in which my overkeen work rate led my foreman to tell me, listen here, mate, this is a job, not a bleeding vocation. <laughs> now I'm the boss of over 100 people at the RSA, and no doubt, here, colleagues can be heard complaining about management heavy-handedness or unreasonable workloads. From the checkout to the C-suite, better work is a goal worth aiming for. For the RSA, committed as we have been for 265 years to human flourishing and creativity, improving the quality of work at a time of rapid change has become an important theme. It's something we plan to focus more on in the future. And as a think tank, we'll continue looking at radical ideas like universal basic income. The general election campaign has so far focused on Brexit, tax and public services. In comparison to these pressing issues, perhaps good work which seems too amorphous an idea, too woolly an aspiration. But might a debate about good work also be a catalyst? Could it be the issue to open up a broader reflection on our aspirations for ourselves and our fellow citizens? A more creative way of thinking about inequality and exclusion a wider conversation about our responsibilities to each other, employer to worker, employee to organisation, consumer to producer. Most people enjoy their work, but too many don't get what they want or what they need. For some people, the issue is basic rights and a decent <coughs> salary. But the thousands of people who've got involved, involved in our social media campaign, Good Work Is, have returned again and again to other themes. Genuine flexibility, being valued and respected, learning and growing, having voice and autonomy, feeling work has a meaning and a purpose. And if this is what we want for ourselves, isn't it what we should want for everyone? Thank you. really thought-provoking um, speech and it, it is interesting that having thought about work in terms of just sort of paying conditions we're now thinking of it in terms of meaning um, and uh, and actually when you were talking about this uh, the technological sort of revolution you sort of think um, firstly will is there any will there be any employment at all but then having to think how, how we adapt and so um, this as you say is a, is a time of change um, certainly the time to, to think about it and so I'm going to introduce you to um, our panel tonight um, we have um, on my uh, right Carolyn Fairburn director general of the CBI so the voice of British business so we'll see what you think about a universal income would be interesting um, and um, on my left um, Professor Dame Carol Black principal of Newnham College Cambridge and expert advisor on health and worked at NHS England and public health um, England so um, really interesting your thoughts on um, on, on well-being and work um, and the idea that actually used to be 
that um, a sort of, you know, the Protestant work ethic was that work is always better than non-work, but um, interesting if that is still the case. And, um, and finally, Peter Cheese, who's chief executive of the Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development, uh, an organization that champions better work and working life. So again, interesting for you on the trajectory of work rather than being um, enough in itself. So if we could start with Carolyn on your perspective. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, and I mean, I think my, my starting point, Sarah, as you say, I, we speak for, for, for many businesses. And I think the first thing to say, Matthew, is there is huge support for what you're trying to do uh, in terms of that objective. So the idea of work being good and fulfilling, I think, uh, hugely supported. Um, it's partly human, it's partly just human, um, but it is also the link that you describe with productivity. Uh, and um, you just, the, the Andy Haldane work, which pointed to the importance of engagement and engaged workforces for productivity, I think has just gone right up the agenda of every business leader I speak to. And, and work that we did at the CBI last year, we, we looked at regional productivity, actually, at quite a detailed level. And we identified four levers that uh, really affected productivity, and the third most important was management practices. It is really, really fundamental. Um, we support change. Um, we want to work with you on change. The question is going to be the how. And I think that's um, the other thing I would say we welcome very much is your openness and you know, this event, others, and we want to work uh, with you on that. If I could just make a few um, uh, comments on, on what you have said this evening. Just one thing I would say, um, and I, I just hope this can come out in your sort of final thoughts. Let's talk about where it's going well because there are brilliant employers out there who are doing brilliant things. We've just had um, a book out from Mark Price from, from John Lewis, uh, Waitrose, talking about fairness for all, when he talks about the power of engagement. And, and I have to say, I do think we have, we have made great progress. And actually, I really welcomed in your speech, but most people do enjoy their job. We have had progress. We have got um, holiday pay. We have got maternity and paternity rights. We have got protection against discrimination. These are all things we should talk about. And actually, when I talk to, to businesses, one of the best parts of my job is getting out around the country. And often what a CEO wants to talk to me about is their apprenticeship program. They want to show me their young people. They want to talk about uh, their people. So one, one request, I guess, Matthew is that in the next iteration let's talk about um, where things are going well and there's a really practical reason for that actually is that I think because there is such recognition in the business community of the importance of this they are looking for practical ideas about what works and frankly I think that we'd like to help on that because we talk to so many businesses of all sizes what's the handbook what's really works so just if I could put that um, really um, on the table from the beginning Back to um, some more uh, concrete points. Um, a couple of areas where I think we agree very, very strongly. The power of engagement, um, the power of involving people in decision making. And um, I think that this is an area where we've seen great progress. The handbook and the ideas can help. I think there is going to be a role for, um, for something that appears in corporate governance rules. Something that we support is that every firm should set out what they are doing to bring a, an employee voice to the board table. Comply or explain, set it out. So I think that is a really important part of, part of things. Um, we also agree with you on your point about training and progression and the importance of pathways to work. I mean, the statistics are interesting. We, we could have a debate around that. There's a danger of comparing apples and pears. Um, the UK does spend less in terms of off-the-job training, but actually it does more on-the-job training. In a sense, though, I think, as you say, we need to move beyond some of that. What do we do? And pathways to work, particularly for our young people, and then all the way through life uh, as, as, as careers and work changes, are going to be absolutely vital. We think that there is a lot of practical thinking to be done about how the apprenticeship levy is used really well. Let's, let's work it out. It's three billion pounds. It's a, it's a once in a generation opportunity. Frankly, it's not right yet. It is all about quantity and not about quantity, uh, 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 not about quality. Let's get that right. The T skills, uh, the T levels, the, the, the vocational training, fantastic. Let's get that right. Um, there is something around the technology point that's really important here, which is that um, 
I think there's a lot to be optimistic about in terms of the kind of jobs that can be created. But one of the things that risks breaking down is the pathway between low skilled and high skilled. And there's a kind of broken bit in the middle, which means that we need to work particularly hard on that. But let's have the collaboration. Let's have uh, the partnership uh, on that. Um, a couple of cautionary notes, if I may, um, just around, um, again, thinking about the how. The first is, let's not demonize certain kinds of jobs. Let's not demonize flexible and praise fixed. I mean, the irony is actually we've made huge progress on flexibility in the past few years. I don't think it is about flexible versus fixed. It's about exactly as you say, it's about good work. And let's focus on that and not demonize certain kinds of employment. Um, and I would just make a, a final point, if I may. I completely agree with you that there isn't a trade-off between uh, good work and, and, and um, uh, employment levels. I think we should be able to have both. But let's not underestimate the fantastic thing we have in our employment rate. We have the highest employment since records began. And I think it's very interesting, if you look at what's happened, what we have in France, and the anger that is created by 10% unemployment levels, by 35% unemployment to young, pe young people. You look at India, 7% growth rates, but entirely jobless, the biggest worry they have. We mustn't take that for granted. It's been fantastic. And so we must retain that ability to create jobs. But just to sort of finish, we hugely welcome being included, Matthew. Um, we really look forward to engaging on the how. Um, we think this is a very, very worthwhile goal and look forward to being your partner on this going forward. Great. Can I, uh... <laughs> Can I just briefly pick on that? You mentioned Mark Price um, yes. and, um, and his idea of sort of fairness and one yes. thing he does bring up is inequality at work and particularly the, the question of bosses pay that it has um, that it became sort of out of control didn't um, reflect performance and therefore set a, it was a, a slightly sort of toxic um, culture do, do, do you think that that's something that should be addressed in, in it's a problem this yeah. it, it is a problem and uh, you know every every member of the CBI I speak to recognizes that um, there has to be uh, uh, Pay has to be for really good performance, and there has to be a sense of there has to be a sense of fairness around this. And I mean, essentially, we've engaged, we've we've really, in terms of what businesses can do, having really good proposals on this. So, I mean, I do think that the role of shareholders in um, in binding votes, and we've got a proposal on the table which is around a, a, a yellow card actually for firms that have a shareholder vote against them. Um, and these are things that need to be taken incredibly seriously because the fairness point is absolutely fundamental. And universal basic income? No. Oh, Sarah, you, you gave me a bit of warning. <laughs> you gave me a bit of warning. The only thing I would say about that, I mean, I think this is a time for really good ideas and really big ideas. I'm not sure we're quite ready for that one. And the reason, actually, is goes back to some of Matthew's point. I think that having a job is actually about self-esteem. I think it's a good thing. I think it's it, the thing about, about, the, about the universal basic income, it does break that link. Now, maybe one day we have to get there, but let's remember we're good at creating jobs in this country. We've got some ideas about how to make those better. We are talking about creating higher productivity jobs going forward. Let's try and sort that first. Okay. Um, so if I could move on to um, mm -hmm. Professor Dame Carol Black on work and well-being. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Matthew, you probably realise I'm delighted by this emphasis on good work. I think it's a really good diagnosis on in what Matthew's had to say. I just wanted to think for one minute about what do we all think good work is, and you probably all have different ideas. I just want to mention two things, but to give you a story about one of them. As I've gone around the country and done my work, it's been security has come pretty much at the top. But the other thing is this sense of control. Do I have any autonomy at work? And I just want to tell you the story of my train driver. Um, this was when I was National Director for Health and Work. I asked DWP to fix me up with, uh, <coughs> with some visits where I thought the jobs were awful. And I could think of nothing worse than going backwards and forwards on a train as the driver in the dark. So at 5 a.m. in the morning, I met my train driver at Baker Street tube station. We went up and down the Bakerloo line. By about 10.30, I was really getting fed up and said, well, couldn't we, 
couldn't we just go on the circle line? Um, I mean, or, or, you know, any other line, but we, we'd gone up and down this quite a lot. And I said, you know, you started pretty early. Wouldn't it be better for you and your family if you could have the afternoon shift or perhaps the evening shift? And of course, if you had a good employer, he wouldn't leave you a m every month underground. You'd have three weeks perhaps <laughs> underground and a week above. You could talk to people as they went through. Um, anyway, he was deeply pleased to get rid of me. Um, <laughs> And he said something which I really appreciated. As I got off that train, he said, look, I'm in charge. Nothing happens on this train without I give the orders. I'm responsible for these people behind me. I'm responsible for their safety. I like my line. I, um, we are a team, he said, and we cover for each other. If I have to go to the doctors, somebody else, we work as a team. I don't want a different shift because my family like this shift. And we've got good occupational health and I'm reasonably paid, so off you go. <laughs> now that is just one example, so everyone will interpret good work, but that was good work. I've seen very high-powered jobs that are not good work. And I want Matthew to include good workplaces, because I think just as much as you think about good work, um, a good workplace where you have a CEO who really takes this seriously doesn't just tick the box where the board is engaged. And I like the idea of a non-exec member of the board having as one of their responsibilities the health and well-being of the staff of that organization. Um, that they will get engaged if there's a committee for health and well-being in the organization. They take an interest and report it back to the board just as much as you report back um, financial um, uh, affairs. And of course, I'll come to line managers in a moment. A little story again. Um, I gave away the awards for the small and medium-sized companies, some awards in London, maybe about five years ago. And I was giving it away to a little organization from Northumbria. Uh, uh, and they were dockers. And there were 100 dockers in this company. And they got a new CEO. And that CEO really thought they were unhealthy. So he decided, without asking, um, that he would provide much better canteen food, get rid of all the chips and the sausages. There was to be healthy food, fruit out on the uh, you know, available, plenty of water. Um, he, would, he would introduce um, a discount for them at the local um, gym, etc. And they said, more or less, get lost. And when he did ask them what they wanted, which comes back to something Matthew said about progression and training, what concerned these men was that some of them couldn't read and write. They wanted literacy and numeracy. That's what they were interested in. Then they might consider whether they would stop smoking, eat a more healthy diet. And that's what he did. He went back, got rid of his, what he was doing, and realized these men were going to come on board, be engaged, and participate if he understood what a good workplace was for them. And two years later, they formed their own football team. So I, it, I think, again, it's understanding what your workforce need, and it can vary. And, and just to really support what Caroline said, over the last two years, I've done quite a lot of work with the construction industry, the railway industry, the police, and higher education on thinking about health and well-being at work, good work, and good workplaces. And I want to pay a, a tribute, really, to how far the construction industry has come. It acknowledged that it has the highest suicide rate of any industry. And they have now just started to introduce a program, Mates and Minds, which is about the mental health of those workers. The police have now also acknowledged that, that mental health is a challenge for them. They have their Blue Light Health and Wellbeing <coughs> Charter. And the universities, at last, 
um, have got their healthy universities group. I wish I could get the Russell group to sign up, but I'm certainly um, working on that. So I, I think we need to acknowledge that in all kinds of places, good things are happening. But what people so often ask me is, how do I do it? If you're a little company, um, what do I do to bring this about? Um, just when Matthew asked about, is poor work any better than being unemployed? There's quite good evidence, uh, a lot of it from Australia, that if you are in very poor work, that is psychologically poor, it is worse for you than being unemployed, and indeed possibly worse for you than being in the benefit system. So I know I've got to be careful on, on time. Just one or two things I'd like you to think about. Um, board level engagement to, to support um, good work, that pivotal role of line managers, a lot has been done, but how do you choose your managers, train them and support them? Management of shift work, proper breaks, that's quite important, some work I've been doing with the railways, um, shift work there can have some really unfortunate consequences. Could we create a small but specific set of health and well-being interventions with good toolkits so you don't have to go too far? Public Health England and BITC have got two good ones now on musculoskeletal and mental health incentives. I'm sure you'll remember Simon Stevens when he published his uh, five-year forward view talked about incentivizing um, the NHS organizations to take an interest in the health and well-being of their staff. And we now have a sequin commissioning, as you know, for quality and improvement. We have a sequin on health and well-being. And at last, the finance directors have taken an interest because there is a lot of money to lose or not be able to take if you don't take that interest. We've got 12 demonstrator sites and we're putting in a rather discreet offer to see if we can make a difference. Um, that's about, I think about 75,000 um, workers. Of course, that's small in terms of the NHS, but we are trying to do it properly with some measurement and just some very early um, uh, very, very small results. One hospital in Birmingham has saved 42 weeks of staff time across 100 individuals by actually getting some proper, well-constructed musculoskeletal support for their workers. And the West Midlands Ambulance Service, I'm sure, will not mind me telling you that with the sport of Slimming World, um, they've um, been working with 392 individuals um, and they have had a good, a good return on, on weight loss. So just, just two examples, and then a final one, which is in the boiler house, so to speak, the West Midlands project um, on mental health. We're trying to create um, a project where we can trial the offer of a discount on business rates in return for employees um, committing to pursue interventions that are tested, and if they're found to be useful, um, then we can um, throw it out much further. So I should just stop there, but I, I think that this is wonderful. I'm so glad this work's happening, and anything I can do to support you, of course, I'm there. Thank you very much. And, and can I, I just pick up on, on this? Um, evidence that a benign workplace um, will increase productivity. Is that, is that um, without doubt, because it's an odd thing about this country, isn't it, that we do have um, high employment, um, but we're, um, we're just not as productive as we keep saying and with sort of anguish as France. Um, so we seem to work hard, but to no great avail. And, and do you think there was something about this sort of throwaway workforce um, that we've created which um, makes us flexible and, and, and good and we create jobs partly because we can get rid of people um, but somehow um, we, we haven't invested and, and, and that's the key to productivity. I mean you, you seem to think 
that, that there is. A, well, I a think clear cause it, it is one of the things yeah. we haven't done properly. Yeah. And so I think if we could get our heads around doing yeah. this in a much more um, organised way yeah. and then take measurement, it is inordinately difficult yeah. to get good measurement, I'm sure Karen will know, from businesses on a return on investment in the sort of really yeah. hard cash terms. One or two can do this. Um, I would love to take a dive deep with one or two really large organisations mm. where you could really get them, I don't say a, a randomised controlled trial because that sounds terrible, but at least a controlled environment where, where you could really measure um, these things. But I think when you look at, at, at engagement scores and, and, the, and the work um, that I think Nita's sitting there, yes? And, and David have done on Engage uh, for Success. I think uh, you can measure certain things. Mm. I don't think we've done it often enough and well enough. I think we could do better, but I think we certainly have evidence that very good practice improves things. And the UCL report um, that came out in November of last year looked at this exact question and showed that you can get a return mm. on investment. And is there something with the sort of altruistic ruthlessness, if, um, if you can call it that, of, 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 say, the sort of tech giants that create workplaces so fabulous and with free food and so on that no one ever goes home, so you never see your families. <laughs> I, I, your I, life is your work. Is it, uh, what do you think of that? <laughs> well, I think free food is, is, is the icing on the cake or the plastering on the cracks, if I can be very bold. Um, because I think if you haven't got the leadership right, if you haven't got the engagement of the board really there, and if you haven't given real thought to line manager training and support, then I think these other things are nice to have, mm. but they will pull apart. Um, some people talk about total worker health, and I like that because the concept that you've worried about the very ordinary things like health and safety, us with the health and safety executive, but you really want to embed all the things we're talking about into the very bones of an organisation and make it sustainable. I think that's where I want us to get to. Um, so, Peter Cheese, if um, you could tell us a bit about um, career progression and whether that matters. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Matthew, also for the invitation. I mean, this is an incredibly important conversation which we're all having here. Um, for those of you who don't know the CIPD, we are the professional body for HR and people development. Um, as Sarah said, our purpose, which we drew out about four or five years ago, is to champion better work and working lives. So we've done a lot of research on many of these themes, and I'll touch on some of it, but echoing a lot of what's been said. You know, I think what's interesting about, Matthew, the things you point out about what people most value in work, there's years of behavioral science evidence which shows those are precisely the things that motivate and engage us. Some of you will have read Dan Pink's book called Drive of the Surprising Truth about what motivates us. And he's drawn together all this evidence, which we've known for 30 or 40 years, that says it's about purpose, it's about autonomy, and it's about mastery, which is the idea we all want to improve. Um, it's also interesting to think that our background as an organization, we were founded 100 years ago as the Workers' Welfare Association. And I think we've forgotten about, more about this subject than we, we now know in many ways. So you know, in many senses, I also see this coming back to our roots. But the reality also of the future of work, and which is part of why this debate is so important, is that there are a lot of things changing. People talk about the fourth industrial revolution and all sorts of ideas of that nature. You know, what will work be in the future? What will be the nature of jobs we do? Will it be more tasks than jobs? Or will it be combinations of things? The growth of jobs today is much more in small enterprise. A lot of young people are saying, well, I'm not even sure I want to work for a big business because I'm not sure I have much voice or much say about what goes on. But there's also many people working as self-employed and contractors who maybe don't always have the choice. So as we think about the future of work, which maybe provides many more options and the idea of flexibility, which, which we've touched on, and is an elemental thing, I think, to creating more opportunity for people, it's this balance between the idea of flexibility and the idea of security. And is there a trade-off to be made between the two? Um, we've got a yeah, very much more diverse workforce today. I mean, we've been talking for ages about Gen Y, and still I see research reports on it, even though they make up most of the workforce in the next five years. Um, but how that 
the ex expectations of the younger generations are changing. And, the, and as I said, this growing mix of a workforce now, which is much more not just about employees, but about contractors and about the self-employed, and hence uh, what Matthew's been asked to do to help us understand these things. And yet in organizations, we've not always been looking at these people who are contractors and the self-employed, and we just worry about our employees. Well, we're going to engage all of the workforce, and we're going to understand all of these elements now of our future workforces as well. But then you look at you know, what's going on. So this is why it's so elemental. So you've got these trends. Which we, if, if you look at the trends of work, you could argue some of the things we already see might get worse. So stress at work is an extraordinary thing, isn't it? You know that John Maynard Keynes almost 100 years ago said, by now we should be working 15-hour weeks. Uh, most of us are working 15-hour days, and you kind of wonder what happened in the meantime. Stress, from our research, number one source of absence from, work, from the workplace. The stagnation of engagement, I mean, and, and we're working very closely with Engage with Success Movement, it is really, really important, and yet somehow it's not really ticking up in the ways that it should. The lack, frankly, of progress around diversity and inclusion. I mean, how important is that? I mean, gender uh, diversity, which we're still debating, we don't have enough women retained in, in organizations coming through to the top. Um, the productivity challenge, and I always love the quote, the fact we seem to be 20% less productive than the French, which called out a headline that said, if, we, if the French didn't work on Friday, they'd still be more productive than the Brits. And most people said, I didn't think the French worked on Friday anyway. Um, <laughs> So we got all those sorts of ideas, and then flexi work. I mean, yes, it's it's an important thing. It's now enshrined in law, right to request. But yet the cultures of work are still about presenteeism. They, we find it really hard through our managers to say how do I encourage and develop flexible working environments. And the sad fact, as as an organisation called TimeWise has shown, is that less than 10% of jobs uh, for over 20k a year are advertised as, as possibly working flexibly. So we're not promoting it, and we're not really building these flexible working cultures. And of course, there are good examples which we need to play on, but there's a lot more that we've got to do. And the lack of meaning, I read a really interesting thing from HBR. There was a survey of 12,000 professionals who said that half felt their job had no meaning or significance. These are professional people. Um, or, and half were unable to even relate to their company's mission. You think, this is extraordinary stuff. Um, so... You know, as Brad Pitt said in Fight Club, and seen, anybody seen that film? I, I love you know, taking references in different places. He said, too often we're working in jobs we hate so we can buy, uh, buy stuff we don't need, which I thought was quite a profound observation. You know, so we, we have got to think about some of these trends and really address them, which is why we're very, very supportive of what Matthew's trying to accomplish. So just to spend a little bit of time on, on so what are the challenges? Why haven't we been making, been, been making some of the progress? I and we believe we need a shift in mindset. Yeah, there is a shift in mindset. We are seeing good examples of organizations that are trying to do these things. But I think historically over the last you know, intervening decades, we've very much have a, had a deterministic view, view of people at work. Somebody described to me recently that we've treated people at work as if they're bad robots. We write lots of rules and lots of processes in order to try to control them as opposed to really empowering them and, and getting the best from them. Um, too much command and control. Uh, Best practice is a really interesting construct too, because I think too often we say, well, here's the manual of best practice, and as long as we all do this, then we'll all be fine. And I would say that our profession in HR has been as guilty as any of just taking things like performance management, which is one we're debating so much, and saying, well, if everybody else does that, then it must be okay. And actually what we need to really question is what is the purpose of things like performance management? Why do we do these things? Um, from rules to principles. Yes, we need rules, but my goodness, you can't change behavior just by writing more rules. And the good news is the regulators are talking about this more. The FRC, in, in the review of the corporate codes, is talking much more about how do we start to think about principles. And that is exactly, I think, Matthew, what you're trying to encourage, about the principles that could work. And then, as you say, Carolyn, how do you then get the visibility, if, if we espouse these ideas in the organizations we lead, then how do we give more visibility and transparency to the fact that we are driving towards those sorts of principles? And therefore, also, this movement towards what is being described as evidence-based management. Where is the evidence? Let's take that last question you just asked, Sarah. Where is the evidence that I can show that improving engagement improves productivity? Which which also begs the question, particularly in many knowledge-based businesses, is do I understand what productivity is? It's much easier to understand in a manufacturing concept. It's harder to understand in a lot of the knowledge economy which we drive. Um, we've got to rebuild trust, too. I mean, we have to confront some of these things. And uh, the, the Edelman's trust barometer, if you're familiar with it, has shown this, this growing disconnect, and we've seen it in the political debate, too, between how people regard the so-called establishment, and that includes their business leadership as well. 
um, and therefore go more to uh, these ideas of purpose and principles. Uh, you will remember the United Airlines story of the guy being dragged off the plane. Anybody, you, uh, is anybody in the audience in the 1K club of United Airlines, which is their top 1,000? Did you get their letter from Oscar Minos? Do you remember what it said? He said that um, it happened because our corporate policies were placed ahead of our shared values and our procedures got in the way of our employees doing, doing what they know is right. Do you think that's quite profound? And don't you think that is also what we should be doing? Why weren't we kind of doing it before? So we'll, we'll wait and see. I mean, you're part of the 1K club, so you can tell us whether it's actually happening. <laughs> um, so these ideas of, of principles of good work are really important. And as I said, to emphasize the point, how do we get there more transparency? I think there's no question. You know, th this, this adage that what gets measured gets done or what gets measured gets paid attention to. We can keep telling ourselves that we're changing our corporate cultures and we're doing good work, but I think we need more transparency as well. Because the first question you have to ask is, does the leadership understand this stuff? Do they actually understand it? And you know, if you look at it all the way through to corporate cultures, Deloitte's 2016 Global Human Capital Trends Report said that 82% of survey respondents believed that culture is a potential competitive advantage, yet only 28% of them believe they understand their culture well, and only 19% believe they have the right culture. Well, a lot of what we're talking about here is, is about culture and behaviors, as much as I said about rules and, and things of that nature. So we need more insight on what are the things that we understand, all the way from the makeup of our workforces today, because if we're espousing principles of inclusive workforces, we should be able to report on that, and through to things like corporate culture. So then, you know, just to, to try to draw its conclusions, they're also about these capabilities. You know, what have we got to do inside organizations? And we've already touched on the idea of engagement, how important that is, well-being, how important that is. What are the practices that are going to drive us there? And just to very quickly reiterate what Engage Success said, four drivers, strategic narrative. Do my, do my people understand what we're about? You know, the mission, the vision, the purpose, the, the values of the organization. Have I got managers that are engaging me? Are they well trained? Have I got employee voice? Is the voice being heard? And where is and how is that voice being heard? And is there integrity between what I say and what I do? So those are very, very key drivers which we need to enshrine in practice as well. We've got to train the managers. We've all talked about that. We've got to train the managers. And we, it is a reality, I think, in my experience, that many times what we've done is promote managers because of their technical competence. We've got to pay more attention to the fact as to how do they deliver that, how do they engage the team, support their, uh, and coach their staff, and so forth. The investment of people and skills is very obvious. We do have big gaps. We're all kind of pointing at the numbers and trying to understand how different it is. But there's, there's a fact that in the UK, we have underinvested in our workplace an underinvested in the workforce. We have an under, it's not just a, an unemployment, which is good to see high employment, but we have an underemployment because we are not using all the skills and capabilities of our workforce. Um, and that is something we have to address through better investment in the workplace to make sure we're designing and developing jobs that use those skills and showing the progression routes. So there's lots of practice to think about, and those, of course, are very things close to our heart because a lot of them are about HR practice as well, which we need to inculcate and get the profession itself to think much more about these ideas. So in conclusion, I wanted to uh, give you a thought. Um, I, I talked about Brad Pitt as one source of my inspiration, but another is Aristotle. Um, so I've gone from Brad Pitt to Aristotle. You know about this concept of eudaimonia that you talked about? Yeah, and I find this really interesting because this is a profound inflection point we are at in the world of work. And if we really think about what's it all for and what Aristotle talked about, what is the purpose of humanity and where should we be leading to as we become better at what we do. And he talked about this idea of eudaimonia, which very simply could be understood as kind of ten contentedness and happiness. It's enshrined in the American uh, Declaration of Independence. You know, my right to happiness, my right to liberty, um, uh, what was it, liberty, um, sorry, right to life, liberty in the pursuit of happiness. So I think in the end, good work is, it's about trying to create a better culture and a better environment where people can be happy and can be content. So I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. If I could just pick up on a, a couple of things. One was uh, that you mentioned the motivations for people being um, flexibility and control. You, you don't mention money. And um, is that because um, no one expects money anymore but because of such wage um, stagflation? Or um, is there a genuine shift to sort of meaning is as good as a pay rise? 
Um, money is very important, yes. I didn't touch on so much. I mean, you asked the question about exact pay, and this, mm. as we've all acknowledged, it's something we have to address. So we've got to make sure there's a fairer distribution of wealth than we have today. There are, it's growing too much at the high end, and it's not growing equally. So if you go back to the old models of motivation, you know, there's a basic level of wealth. We need to feed ourselves, to look after ourselves. People have different variables as to what that would mean to them. But then beyond that, you're very quickly into these other ideas, you know, all the way through to, you know, from Maslow's perspective, self-actualization. So I, I agree with, with Karen's points that the other things that you could do in the workplace, which aren't just about paying people money, it's about how they, you recognize them, how you treat them with respect, how they work together with their colleagues and all these other ideas. But I do think underpinning it, yes, we, we can't move away from the fact that we have you know, increasingly disproportionate exec pay and a challenge in a future world of work, and all the economists are pointing to this now, where productivity in the past, has, wages have gone up with productivity, and interestingly, they can point to exactly when it started to split away, in about the mid-90s, that productivity carried on, not as much as it should, but average wages stagnated. Now, that is about a distribution of wealth, and, and that's why you might even think about universal base, basic income as a way to distribute wealth. Um, and, and just one other thing on, on the sort of in investment in your workforce. Um, do you think that um, Brexit gives you an opportunity for that? For the, part of the reason that we, you didn't need to invest was because you could always bring right. people in. Um, how important is that, yeah, that if we're now suddenly going to get the shortage of workers? I think it's an incredibly important point. Um, yes, I think there is no hiding from the fact that we in this country have had access to a huge number of skills, big migrant inflows of, of workers, lots of graduates and all of that. And I think it has, in many organizations, is one of the reasons we haven't invested enough in the workplace. It's a lower risk thing, arguably, to take on a worker than invest in the job. Um, so I absolutely agree that one of the opportunities, I'm already seeing it, many more organizations thinking more strategically about their workforce, and what am I going to have to invest in the future, starting with a great question, which is, how many EU workers have I got? I've just come from one of the, uh, one of the university colleges of London, uh, who said that 40% of their lecturers and, and teaching faculty are EU workers. Now, I don't know if they would have known that prior to Brexit, right? So now we're putting these questions on the table, and I think it is calling out what needs to be called out, which is a more profound debate about what kind of workforce do we need in the future, where are we going to get them from, and how do we invest in them properly? Thank you very much indeed. Um, we're um, running slightly short of time, so I think if we go straight to questions um, from the audience, I think we can, we can take like, three. Um, so should we start? Um, over here, um, second row. Um, hi, Sue Chan from The Telegraph. A question based on Dame Carroll's comments on this idea of, you know, people want security and control. And you, you use the two examples of the tube driver and the dock workers, which are sort of their employees, they work in teams. I wondered, in a world where the gig economy and wider self-employment is becoming more prominent, can workers still have that security and control, or whether, will there have to be some sort of trade-off in the future for the whole panel? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, well, I touched on the thought, yeah, yeah. security versus mm -hmm. flexibility, right? Um, and it is very interesting, the research we've done on the gig economy, if I take the gig mm -hmm. online platform stuff, um, around 60% of the people are working in that way uh, have also got another job, right? So, so flexibility comes in all sorts of forms. I don't think it's absolutely, you know, inherent that people should have less security. We talk a lot about getting clarity on um, workers' rights. Whatever form of work I have, what are my rights? And people don't always understand that, and we know legislation needs to change to catch up, which is a lot of what Matthew's looking at, with the modern nature of work. Matthew, on, that, on rights in the gig economy. Yeah, I think we found as we went around the country talking to people that the critical issue is whether or not flexibility feels like it's two-way or one-way. And I think the two-way flexibility is great, and people enjoy it, and we shouldn't do anything in our review to reduce it, actually. I think we have got some ideas about ways in which we can ensure that that flexibility can be maintained with new platforms. That's a kind of deregulatory element to what we want to do. But what we also need to tackle is, is one-way flexibility, where really what you're talking about is employers simply transferring risk onto their employees. And so when you hear about people who feel that they have got to be available for work, but they're not guaranteed work, 
people who don't know how much they're going to earn. I think that the issue in, very often is not so much about insecurity of work, it's insecurity of income. And if you don't know how many hours you're going to get next week, you don't know whether you can pay your mortgage, you don't know whether you can pay your debts, you don't know whether you can buy shoes for your kids. So I think we've got to ensure that flexibility is, there's a quid pro quo about flexibility, that, and it benefits both the organisation and the individual, and it's not simply about the transfer of risk. Okay. Well, what do you think about the zero hours contracts? Um, I, I think that uh, it is absolutely right. I think Matthew's absolutely right. It is this kind of concept of fairness. I mean, what we know is that there are benefits and disadvantages to both flexible and fixed. Um, z zero hours for some people is something that they like, and for others it is something that they, that they don't want. I mean, it's interesting that we've had the right to request flexible. Perhaps we should have the right to, reflect, to request fixed. That's a good idea. Um, and, and just introduce something that is parity on that, <laughs> because there is no one... I mean, I just want, made this point about let's not talk about good and bad different kinds of employment. Life is complicated, people are complicated, but let's make it fair. Interesting. And, and the question was originally to you, but so, so do you think um, flexibility is key to happiness? I think it depends what you're being flexible about. And, I mean, I just watch in, in my institution in Cambridge where some of the young women who serve and work in the kitchens in order to get um, a reasonable uh, paycheck move from one college to another. And, and they're pretty sure that they're going to get employment. I mean, it, it, it isn't because there is lots of employment there, but do they really know whether tonight there'll be an extra dinner so they're going to get extra money? So being sure of how much you're going to get is often not there. You know you, you, know you will get some hours, but it's not always, always a secure um, environment, but your type of work will be in demand. So I think often you can see people who are in a certain sector where that type of work is in demand, but will you find it around you mm. and when you want it to fit in with your lifestyle, I think is, is often yeah, a... That's an important control. point here and a challenge for all regulation. It's a point that, that Greg Marsh, who's a member of the review team, is, who's here, has, has made a lot, is that you can't ignore the fact that the labour market is important. If you're in a tight labour market, then you've got more power as an employee. And I think this, this issue of one-way flexibility is particularly bad in loose labour markets where people feel there isn't very much work and they've got to take whatever there is. And I think we do need to think about what we can do to, to, to challenge that, whilst recognising that a lot of people who work flexibly have zero hours, low hours contracts, that does work for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can I just give one other quick thought on it? Because you know, I talked about diversity and the reality of people coming back, women returners to work, let's say that's a specific example, that we, we need to provide more flexibility in, in traditional employment forms as well. Um, and as I said, that takes some cultural change, right? It genuinely does. You've got to train managers to understand the difference between hours input and output produced. And we have a long culture of, of presenteeism, and it's one of the reasons why we have workplace stress. Mm -hmm. and, and we have to see flexible working as something that will, is one of the levers to help us create more inclusive work cultures as well. Could I just say something about women going back to work? Because I feel very strongly about this. That very often when women go back to work after a break, it's my observation, and certainly in certain studies, that you get a rather lesser job unless your employer is, is there to, to provide the sort of challenge or support you may need. And I see too many women who go back to work, but it isn't the sort of really engaging and challenging work that they would necessarily yeah, like. And they've been sidelined. Well, sort, sort, yeah. sort of. Yeah. Sort of. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and they may have been away for a yeah. year, and what they really want is to be embraced. Yeah. Yeah. And, and challenged. I know that's not really on, on your question, but it's something I've thought about quite a lot. Great. I think um, uh, we're running out of time, so I'm going to go to um, one more. Sorry, I'm just... So <laughs> Where do you just, think? Why don't you just take those three? Yeah. Okay, three more questions. I'm we'll led by quickly. you on this. So um, shall we go to... Um, uh, hand at the, uh, this gentleman um, just here. Non-journalist, perhaps. Hi. Hello, uh, I'm Chris Samson, I'm a psychologist. We started with some really great sound bites from the public. I'd like to hear from each panelist your sound bite for what good work is. Oh, sound bite. Why don't you take all three and then, should we take all three questions? Okay. Thanks, I mean, I think any employer that doesn't think 
this topic now matters is on the national agenda runs the risk of having their reputations trashed because uh, poor employment practice now is just out there and transparent and no organization can hide from the impact of social media um, you know exposing what they are doing but I also think I mean I think it's been a brilliant discussion but I think one of the things we need to think about is how do we raise demand from below for good work and I think that the trade unions must have a role in this, but it's also the case that we need to make people you know, aware of the fact that if I set up a website, for example, I would call it workdoesnthavetobeshit.com. <laughs> so you find a way of actually mobilizing people too, because it's very important to get top-down support, but it's also very important to get demand from below for, for, you know, for good employment practice. Grassroots support. Mm. One more, then. Uh, gentleman here. Hi, uh, Paul Fletcher, I'm a fellow. Um, I'll raise a word of concern. I'm hearing a lot about symptomatic relief of these problems, but little about cause. Point in fact, shareholders. External shareholder in a company, by necessity, will exploit or needs that company to exploit. So you cannot make work good if you've got to exploit somewhere. The example of the industry I left recently, construction. Construction doesn't care about people. It doesn't care about people in the products it makes, let alone have any genuine concern for the people that work in it. I was part of the initial working group for that mental health organization, and they've missed the point by a mile because they don't understand the root cause. And my concern is that all we are doing is trying to apply sticky plaster to make ourselves feel better rather than really address how we exploit people for profit of a minority. Okay, so if we uh, go to the panel, so we're looking for a soundbite that includes a reference to grassroots support and, um, and the role of the shareholders, so starting yeah, with you. Um, well, I, I agree that, you know, warm, I'll agree with the final question, warm words aren't enough on their own, and there are issues that need to be addressed by enforcement and by better regulation. So, um, you know, I recognise that, and I would like to see, for example, steps that make that, that significantly increase the number of organisations that are proper mechanisms for people to be engaged. I think that is really important. I think if citizenship matters in society, then citizenship should matter at work, and we need to think about what we do about that. So, yes, there needs to be, you know, uh, tough stuff as well as warm words and principles. Um, in terms of Nita's point, I think data and measurement are absolutely critical. I mean, I don't think that we're likely to say that this is mandatory, but I think it's good practice to have a proper third-party assessment of how your employees feel about work and to publish that. And I would say to organisations, if you don't do that, then people will go to Glassdoor and they'll find out what disenchanted people feel because that's where they go. So, you know, why not uh, have, you know, lots of ways in which you can do it, lots of reputable platforms that you can use. You know, measure how your employees feel and have the courage to put that out there and it can guide your investors and it can guide your consumers, it can guide future employees and that would be a very good thing to do. And then finally, in terms of the soundbite, um, I just return to, I think, a wonderful description offered by someone called Charlie Leadbeater about great organisations and he said that they are creative communities with a cause. And it seems to me that idea, creative communities with a cause, describes the kind of organisation I'd love to work in and I, I hope on a good day that I lead. So Carolyn, tyranny of the shareholder and um, final thoughts. Um, I am so much more optimistic than you are, you won't be surprised to hear, in terms of what um, firms, leaders, businesses can do. I think that there is such a strong recognition that good work is good business, that that connection that we were exploring earlier on is not well enough understood. I completely agree, and I think construction is a sector that is moving, but not fast enough. But, the, but we should be optimistic, because you can see examples everywhere. It's where I started. And if we can embed that, if we can, we can um, encourage it, I think part of this is about information, you know, the Charlie Mayfield work, every company needs to understand this. They need to understand their productivity, the connection it has to their people and engagement. And I really think we should have faith uh, in that. And the other thing I would say is that I think one of the things about Brexit is it's been a shot in the arm. I think it really has. And we have an opportunity now to get a lot more things right. I think the skills conversation we're having now is just a better skills conversation than we've had in decades. So I think we should be optimistic and see this as an opportunity. 
bit of greater awareness? Carol? Well, I just want to um, a soundbite. I would have trust, control, and community. Um, and and I, I hear what you're saying, but you have to start somewhere. And people don't get it right the first time. Um, and I think you have to go on a journey. And I've seen a lot of organizations go on a journey. Um, and th therefore, you, th there may be some things that perhaps we should have mandated. But there was a time when the construction industry did it extremely badly. The, the building of the Olympic Park, they got it much better. And of course, it's not perfect. But I think we should encourage them to actually make it better and show them how to do that and not hit them on the head for the things they're trying to do. Peter. Yes, I mean, first of all, on soundbite, um, I tried to write it in a Twitter response of 140 characters. Um, but I think the big things are meaningful, engaging, and fair. Um, but, you know, I'm really looking forward to seeing the sum total of all these tweets that have been happening. And you should tweet on this, hashtag good work is, so let's hear all of your views as well. But to, to pick up on, on the, these other really important points, uh, I, you know, echo some of the thoughts already made, and I made that in my own observations. I think we need more transparency is, is the reality. Um, because when we talk about good corporate governance, it isn't, to your point, just about satisfying the famous shareholder, whoever that may be, incidentally. Um, it is about a multi-stakeholder view of the world. Um, yeah, so who are, who are all my stakeholders? Well, my employees are clearly a stakeholder. My customers, my suppliers, the environment, we've had quite a lot of debate about that, and the communities in which I serve. We've had debates about people, profit, planet, blueprints of better business. There's lots of these sorts of movements going on, and I do believe we should enshrine greater transparency with a clearer sense of corporate governance, which I think we have that opportunity to echo, echo Carolyn's thoughts. It's that there is a lot more of this debate going on now, and I think we have that chance. But I, you know, as I said in my own comments, I think what gets measured gets done. Then if you get to your point, Nita, about the bottom-up demand, employees will be making their own choices on this stuff. They increasingly are. Gen Y is much less tolerant than my generation for some of the nonsense we've done in business, if I'm honest. And, and so employees will be making more of their choices about this. They will look at a business and say, if you're not telling me that, you, know, you believe in these principles and I'm reading on Glassdoor that actually you say these things, but half the managers in the comments say something different, then that, that's, I think, a very powerful way you get to it. And finally, then, uh, uh, is to echo the thought about the voice, the employee voice. Where do you represent that inside the organization? Uh, and I think you made the, the point, Carol, as well, about these committees. At the highest level of governance, who is paying attention? The what board. are they, At the board level, yeah. Who's paying attention? What are the me measures they're using to understand this stuff? And how do you drive this stuff top down? And when you do that, as I say, be more transparent about what you're doing. Thank you very much. So, um, Matthew, final, final word? I've got nothing to add. It's nothing. Been, uh, <laughs> I'm exhausted, to be honest. <laughs> well, you and I were both Am up I at the same time. The <laughs> well, thank you very much indeed, everyone, um, for coming to this um, fascinating start, I think, um, of the conversation. Um, and thank you very much to um, our panel.